Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Horseman, Data Evangelist with Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing remembering data quality when the data spigot is turned way up, sponsored by IBM. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A section. If you would like to chat with us or chat with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. To find and open both the Q&A and the chat sections, the icons for those features are in the bottom middle of your screen. As always, we will send a follow-up email within a couple of business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me pass it to Daryl for a word from our sponsor, IBM. Take it away, Daryl. Thanks for that, Mark. Let me just share my screen real fast. Okay, so <clears throat> Mark, are you able to see that there? Looks wonderful. Thank you, sir. So uh, my name is Daryl Haswell. I'm a director of product management for data and AI at IBM. Today, I'm just gonna give you a five minute commercial on IBM's data and AI technology and how we bring value in the generative AI space. Um, I always like to start with some, flat, with, some, with some stats, right? So obviously Gen AI is important because if it brings value to your business, um, according to this JP Morgan survey, it's estimated that global GDP will increase by $10 trillion due to generative AI next year alone. It's estimated that at least 45% of all companies are piloting Gen AI today to reap the benefits of it. Um, with all that said, Gen AI can be hard. Uh, that's why only 10% of companies today have put their Gen AI solutions into production. Like I mentioned, Gen AI is super hard um, and in, it leads to something called the enterprise generative uh, AI data problem. Um, the Gen AI data problem refers to the challenges that businesses face in managing data effectively while integrating generative AI technologies into our operations, right? So it's a reflection of your data strategy. So for example, uh, we have tons of companies with fragmented data stacks. Organizations nowadays have more than just one vendor they use in their whole stack to address their data needs. Number two, we see a lot of the businesses uh, uh, have a lot of pressure to cut down costs with automation by generative AI. And then um, the lack of readiness for, gener uh, for generative AI, uh, just making sure like companies are just trying to understand how do we actually prepare data for general AI? All right, uh, almost done here. So bear with me, right? So preparing your data for general AI is probably one of the steepest issues that you have uh, across the organization. What it does, it requires you to have a technology in place to make sure that your data is accurate, relevant, reliable, so that you can make reliable business decisions. Um, if you do have a technology stack in place, here are some of the design principles that you would like to have in that uh, stack. For example, data integration, where you can manage your data across your organization with many integration points. Data intelligence, there's so much information coming in. Uh, there's so much vast amount of uh, data being curated. How do you actually deliver that? Trusted with data quality in place. Hybrid ready, you wanna be able to integrate with any style of data in any location. Of course, you wanna utilize Gen AI uh, to improve your data productivity. And then lastly, you wanna use Gen AI across structured and unstructured data. So, Here's an illustration of IBM's data and AI solution. Uh, it's built purposefully with these four principles in mind. Quality and integrity, 
Uh, so that means you can't build good AI models if your data is not good, right? Trust is essential to the underpinning of Gen AI. All our AI solutions have baked in governance and security guardrails that essential to meet your organization policies. Um, fit for purpose. Bigger is not always better, meaning that we bring domain specific models tailored to address industry specific use cases. And our platform is built on openness. AI, uh, IBM's AI is based on the best open technology like Spark, Presto, Iceberg, uh, Red Hat, and we use even some of the best open source models. So just explain the diagram really quick. On the left-hand side, we have a set of offerings used to prepare your data for AI. So to touch on some of few technologies there for data governance and data quality, we have IBM's Knowledge Catalog. Uh, for products, uh, we have products like Data Stage that make data ingestion fast and uh, simple. We have products like Data Product Hub that allow you to simply share and curate data products to all types of users. On the right-hand side is our uh, uh, data AI stack, as we call it, Watson X. It's made up of three components. First component is called Watson.ai. This is where you train and tune your models. Watson.gov is where you see the transparency and explainability in those models as you build them. And in Watson.data, that's our modern data lake house. And just a couple more points before I, I, I give it back to Mark, is we also have a couple of AI assistants, many AI assistants to help you uh, accelerate work without that expert knowledge, right? So we have something called Watson Code Assist, where we use AI to develop new code. We have Watson Assistant. These are self-service agents, uh, gearbox for your business, for many, in, uh, for many industries. And then we have Watson Orchestrate to help you automate AI tasks. So please come check out more from IBM, ibm.com, artificial, uh, artificial flash intelligence. Uh, and thank you, Mark, for your time today. Awesome, thanks, Daryl. And mm -hmm. now, let me introduce to you our speaker for this series, William McKnight. William McKnight has advised many of the world's best known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake, streaming, and data integration products. William is the number one global influencer in data warehousing and master data management, and he leads McKnight Consulting Group, which has twice placed on the Incorporated 5000 list. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome, my friend. Thank you, Mark. Welcome, everybody. And thank you, Daryl, for, for that great introduction to, uh, to IBM's uh, offerings and a reminder of how important data quality is to the Gen AI initiatives that we are all doing, right? Uh, now, I've heard similar statistics, and it's been my experience that uh, it, it is true. Uh, Gen AI is, uh, or a lot a lot of us are doing it, but there's not a lot of it in production yet. There's been some failures. And so if you're in that camp, you're not alone. Doesn't get you off the hook necessarily, but you're not alone. And one of the reasons why there have been some failures is because of data quality. I have not noticed that data quality is a big thought before launching into these new initiatives, but I have noticed that it becomes one rather quickly once you get into it and uh, can definitely lead uh, you on a good or bad road with that project. So uh, our ability to understand our data quality and, and to understand if it's at a level that is necessary for what we're trying to do with it is really not, not good. And so I hope to bring that up with you a little bit here today so that you can identify the worthiness of your data and see if there are any defects in there that's going to hold you back. So uh, first of all, I do hope that you are all out of uh, harm's way uh, this week. It's been a trying week for a lot of people out there. and. Uh, my hometown, that is the town I grew up in, St. Petersburg, Florida, got absolutely hammered. And I've been checking in all day with them. It 
looks like it's going to be a while uh, to get back to normal there. So um, uh, it, it feels kind of helpless, right, being here. I'm actually in New York City uh, this week. I'm at an event, and I am grateful to be able to break away for this hour with you. Uh, one more announcement. Uh, this series, Advanced Analytics uh, with William McKnight, is renewed for 2025. Next year, I think it will be the fifth year, and I'm excited about that. That's that's a long time in, uh, in, in webinar years, and I'm really excited about that. And that's thanks to you. Thanks to you checking out our sponsors and things like that. So I appreciate that. Now, I am putting together my list of topics for next year. So if you have any ideas, send them my way. As long as it's in my, uh, my bally wig here, uh, I will uh, see if I can't address that. Um, there's just so much going on, so much going on. Uh, this is my second conference of the week. I'll be glad when this week is over, uh, but it has been a, a, a downpour of information. Uh, a lot of it is related to AI and data. Now, data quality has been around a long time. Uh, back to cave, the cavemen, right? Back when one caveman grunted to the other his displeasure that the rock said that we have 100 spears, but he only counted 99. Where's the missing spear? And on and on it went until we are where we are today with it. And let me advance the slide. Okay, enterprise data is still a mess, to be sure. Uh, that's what I see out there. And uh, that's confirmed by a lot of statistics and probably your experience as well. Uh, data quality is not sexy. Uh, the data architecture is sexy. The products are sexy. Uh, making things happen with the business, that's all sexy. The UI, yeah, but not necessarily data quality. And this is uh, to our chagrin because that is what ultimately uh, is uh, probably a number one factor, I'd say, in holding back so much, like the push into AI. So hopefully you can understand. I had to put out a little FUD there, a little fear, uncertainty, and doubt to get us started in this journey with data quality today. And by the way, we are going to talk about data quality as it relates to streaming data. Yes, uh, the data deluge has not stopped because we don't have our Data Quality Act together, has it? No. As a matter of fact, the streaming data, big data, it's just making it worse. <laughs> it's just making the problem worse. And so let's see what we can do about that. Now, I love this slide because it, it conveys uh, something very important, and that is where we put our emphasis. We put our emphasis so many times on the uses of data, the BI layer, the UI, the applications, and of course, they need our attention. But what lies under the waterline is that data infrastructure in terms of importance. So it's very important that we address that as well and not keep kind of band-aiding, if you will, our architectures. Um, but what gets the budget? My experience is what gets the budget is business functionality. We've got to deliver business functionality. And so uh, that means all the things I mentioned before that are the sexy parts of it, not necessarily the data quality part of it. So it's, it's up to us to make sure that there's some budget for data quality. Now, I don't believe that you're going to get a budget to address data quality overall. That might be data governance. You might get a budget for data governance, and that is supposed to be an oversight function for this, and I'll get into that a little bit. But uh, I don't know that you're going to get a, a project to go out there and sweep through data quality. You're going to have to get creative about this. You're going to have to get creative. Now, data quality is essential to business success. Correct data is a widespread need. We all need it, we all can agree on it until it gets time for action. And then we need people that will step up and actually take that action. Yet data quality lacks consistent definition. I'm going to go with, and I don't believe I originated this, but I'm going to go with a lack of intolerable defects in the data, lack of intolerable defects. I didn't say perfect. I didn't say the data had to be perfect or else it violated data quality, but it has to be good enough, fit for purpose, and keep in mind that a lot of times we are talking about data quality in a data lake, data quality in a data warehouse, in a master data management hub, in something that's highly shareable. 
And so it has a lot of leverage in the organization. So you can't, you can't just bring data quality to a level that's good enough for that first application. You got to bring it to a level that's good enough for eventual applications. Otherwise, that warehouse or whatever it is may not get used. And that's totally inefficient for the company. This all being said, getting executives to pay, let's say, $2 million for a data quality program or to add 500 k whatever it may be, to a project to address data quality, that's really hard. That's really hard. It's something that I ultimately try to insist on. It's like one of the hills that I will, will die on maybe uh, in a project because I really think it has to happen. However, like I said, you may have to get creative and sometimes Dark William comes out and, uh, and he will find ways to make sure that uh, that 500K or whatever it may be gets burdened into other aspects of the project yet used for data quality. So I'm, I, that's Dark William now. I'm not, I'm not saying for you to do that, but I'm just saying that is there is a path there. Most people don't care about it until they do. So we all care about it or we wouldn't be here. Um, but doesn't necessarily mean your management, your peers, uh, and anybody else out there really cares about data quality until it bites them in the face. It's usually not considered critical path, but it is. You must be an advocate because you may be the only one that knows that it might be a problem. Cite the improved chance of success of the project. Yeah, that's what it comes down to, ROI. There is ROI in data quality. I don't know that I'm going to get into data quality ROI formulas for you here today, but the point is that you will have to bring it back to the improved chances of success and the improved chances of efficacy of projects out there in your organization. And it's a slippery slope, by the way. You let data quality start slipping, well, uh, the chances of success go way down. So let's, say, let's just put a number on data quality. Let's say at 99 data quality, 99 score for data quality, your project has a 99% chance of success, at least according to this dimension of the project. Well, do you think that at 93 data quality score, it's still 93%? No, it doesn't work like that. At 93, you've dropped that far, I'd say your chance of success now is about 53% when it comes to data quality. So that's what I mean by slippery slope. Um, you gotta, uh, you've got to address the biggest bang for the buck items in your data quality failures and uh, make sure that you're, you're keeping that number up. All right, investments in data quality, they yield cleaner data. So what, okay, <laughs> business objectives cannot be met without quality data in support. You have to know about the data quality and then you have to act on the data quality. It's not good enough to know. And it's also not good enough to jump in and start acting without knowing what those big bang factors are. So we're not trying to beat the data into submission to us. We're trying to attack those things that make sure that quality gets up to a certain standard. And will I keep going at that point? Probably not. I want to bring it up to that standard. And I like to take it back to a number. And all this, by the way, all this, all this also applies to big data. So that's why I'm kind of regrounding us in great, I hope, uh, data quality foundational aspects, because we've got to take this mentality into big data. And if we don't have this down, we're going to get to big data and we're just going to be fumbling around with it. And we, I don't want that. Uh, let's, let's, let's actually bring data quality into uh, big data as well. You don't necessarily need a tool, by the way, to do this data quality, although, although tools do have uh, value propositions to us today, especially if you have a critical path project that you're doing or you have real data quality issues. Sometimes you may not discover that you have real data quality issues until you do get a tool and train it on the data and, and hold up that light, hold up that mirror uh, to the data. However, uh, now I could give a whole presentation on this, but a tool can be very distracting as well by showing you things that, yeah, okay, those are violations, but maybe they're not important or maybe they hardly ever happen. Those aren't the ones that you want to work on. There is a big cost to the enterprise of 
poor data quality. It, it is not a one-off. It is not a one-off. It is a program. Every enterprise needs to treat it as such and not feel like they went out there, they fixed the data quality, and now we can move on uh, to other things, bigger and better and more important. It's, it's an ongoing effort. And it can definitely cause enterprise initiatives to fail. You can definitely have a lot of misguided roadmaps that are way too optimistic uh, without that data quality element. I want to be sure. I want to feel better. And so does your management. They want to feel secure in the, in the plans and the roadmaps that they lay down. And you definitely don't want to miss the aspect of data quality. I say in order to actually build a roadmap, in order to build really an application plan, you need to know what the data quality is of that application, of that data warehouse, whatever the case may be. Uh, and, and without knowing that, you don't know the data quality effort. So if you've got somebody giving you a giving you a three month, six month, this or that for a project, and they have no idea about the data quality, haven't even asked, uh, I would wonder about that. I would wonder about that. So um, I love it when one of my clients can put a dollar value on data records that are attributed to some of these data quality issues like failed outreach, losing customers, storage space and effort with duplicate records. I have a client that can walk around and they've already webbed it into the culture that there's a hundred dollar cost for every data record that is uh, of poor data quality. Now, is it a hundred really? Eh can be more or less, I suppose, depending upon the record, but that's not the point. By, by having that to be part of their culture, they've already advanced the conversation. And if, if they can identify, well, if we do this, it might violate data, it might you know, cause a data quality issue in 10,000 records, everybody already knows, oh, that's gonna cost $100,000 right there. We don't wanna do that. So it's great when you can put those kinds of numbers on it. It's not really hard to find out uh, going out there on the internet, you can find out, you know, what AWS, for example, what they what they put their number on, uh, what and and they have that walking walking around knowledge inside their company about this. Uh, eBay, Google, same thing. Of course, they're they're those are huge companies, right? But uh, if they can do it, we can do it too. And by the way, kind of the walking around knowledge here uh, is that LLMs obviously part of our big data, big data science infrastructures, their data quality is about 85%. That's kind of the walking around number. And I like that. I think that's probably accurate in my experience uh, and in some of the uh, benchmarks that I've seen. So yeah, if that's a big part of your data set for a project, you have to ask yourself, is that good enough? Is that good enough for a finance project? Is that good enough for customer touch and, and so on? Hmm. I know it'll go up, but let's take that into consideration. And we may have to add some fine tuning of the models, may have to add some prompt engineering, some RAG, et cetera, to those LLMs. And I talked more about that last month. So if you want more on that, please go back, find it on YouTube and uh, learn more about that. So the benefit of clean data is not enough. We love it. Again, we love it. But uh, at some point, we have to turn that into ROI, strategic benefit, and lower TCO. And I might add, uh, improved uh, probability of success of the project. And everybody wants that. Data quality should have a value proposition to projects. Every project. Improved decision making, whatever the case may be, whatever it's trying to do. And all these things, right? En enhanced security, improved compliance. Etc. These are all related to data quality and data quality violations. It's true for big data as well. So the, it's not really that hard if you think in the right way to turn data quality into a monetary value proposition to the company or to an application. Now, this is where I have to bring up data governance, and I'm sure this is a boring time of the presentation for some of you because everybody talks about it and, and blah, blah, blah. Nobody's doing it. <laughs> but it is it is really an, a very important part of data quality. It keeps the business interest in data quality and it's a way to leverage 
from the point of view of the data practitioner, that data quality out into the business by getting some, some champions of data quality that might actually do something that might support our data quality initiatives and so on. And so, yes, I have to say that data quality, of course, I've seen good and bad in data quality programs out there, but uh, they can be good uh, if they're if they're focused on job number one of data governance. It is data quality. Okay, so coming up with the rules, coming up with the remedies, making sure that that happens, uh, and so on around that. So I'm going to get more into into what the program looks like here in a minute, but they are oversighting this in 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 a good company that's doing this. Okay, only a methodological approach will work, not a one-off. It's a repeatable process. It's not going out there again with the hammer, fixing the problem and walking away. It's a repeatable process. Data keeps coming in the front door uh, and we must see progressive improvement. You're probably not going to go from a 93, remember I talked about this, a 93 to a 99 overnight. It's going to go to 94, 95, etc. Now, I, I admit, some things go a long way, and those are the things you want to work on. Still takes time. Still takes time. And we're dealing with a lot of new data sets uh, today, and a lot of the data sets that we're dealing with now are third party. They're, they're out of our control. And those data sets have less data quality than we would like, than, than we're applying, in most cases, to our own data. Yet, we're trusting that data, we're using that data. Th that data also needs to go through data quality. So all of what I'm saying applies to all data. The causes of poor data quality keep coming in the front door. Yeah, those new, da new data, new data sets. Um, and, and really, still, uh, it's still a problem uh, on the front end in terms of the data that gets entered that gets brought into the organization. I work more on the analytical side, not exclusively, but I work more on the analytical side. Most of the audience of this webinar also does. So we're not actually originating the data. What about that? Garbage in, garbage out, right? No, no, that is not good enough. Please quit saying that because if it's garbage in, we have to do something about it and it's gonna be on us to make sure it doesn't turn into garbage out. Uh, that garbage in, garbage out business, I've heard it a million times, just not good enough. Uh, th there will be poor reflection upon anybody that's in, that, in the chain of data if it's garbage out ultimately. So watch the garbage in, watch the language, and make sure that everybody is on board with fixing the garbage. Now you might fix it at source, Probably not, in my experience, it's very hard to get the ERP team to do much about their ERP system. And frankly, they're on a different schedule, different people, all that sort of thing. So I, I, I'd, I'd rather take care of what I can. And if that means changing the data that's coming to my, uh, my uh, structures, then that's what we'll do. All right, let's get into a data quality improvement program. Again, not a project, not a one-off. It goes like this. Define the quality expectations. Profile the data. Where are we? Again, this don't forget step one. Define what you're expecting out of the data because if you jump to step two, oh, let's profile the data. And we're just looking at like, like widgets. You know, we don't, we don't know what the data is. Let's, well, let's see what the tool tells us about the quality of the data. No because the tool will tell you a lot. Even your data profiling, uh, programmers love to get carried away with this. They may find things, uh, but if it's within the quality expectations that you have, and it's not you, right? It's the data governance group as representative of the business. If it's within those expectations, then it's fine. Then it's fine, move on. Then measure the data quality improvement options. There's always options about improving data quality. You might fix the data in route to, let's say the data warehouse, let's say the data lake, that's more like it today. You might fix that data. You might say, whoa, don't bring that data in here because it's no good. You might move it to a data stewardship panel. This is very popular in uh, master data management projects. 
to have someone actually look at it and determine what is going on with that data and do a manual fix on it somehow. Select the best option. And finally, you are improving the quality of the data and the business. So these are the various rule categories. I'm not gonna go through all of them. I have, I have had uh, webinars in the past where I have belabored uh, the rule categories and the process and so on. Um, but I wanna get to some big data here in a minute. But these are the same rule categories that to me apply to big data as well. Ultimately, it's about aligning business processes with data-driven insights and making sure that there are no violations that are uh, material in any of the bullets that you see here, referential integrity, uniqueness, and so on. Things we know what they are, I think. Um, and and, and there's, a, there's a point at which you have to decide, am I doing enough? Have I brought that data to a standard? And this is where when you grade your data, it helps you with that conversation. And if, have I done enough? Have I done enough? And uh, you can always do more. And uh, you can always keep going till you get to 100%. Uh, you won't get there and you won't stay there. But I, I say that there's a standard uh, that you want to figure out with the help of your data governance and make sure that you bring it to that standard. Now, I kind of got ahead of myself. These are the actions that you can perform for data quality. You can screen that data entry, add cross-checking so the data will be checked before it comes to you, quarantine that data for decisions. Talked a little bit about that with MBM, right? Report on those quality violations. You're not really doing anything, but you're reporting. You're bringing that information back to the uh, data stewards that are part of the data governance program, that still may require additional action to fix data quality. But things that, are there, things that are in the gray area, I think this is how I'll sum it up for you. Things that are in the gray area, uh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna report that back. I'm gonna report that back to data governance and, and let them think about that. Now, there's a skill and, a, and an art, I guess, to uh, reporting back. And, and, and there's a skill and an art to bringing data into quarantine for someone to look at if you if you overdo it. <laughs> and there's a hundred actions there for uh, somebody who already has an eight hour day uh, of other things. Um, and you know, the chances are it's going to get ignored. But if you have 10, I don't know, maybe maybe they'll get they'll get accepted. Uh, I don't think you're going to turn this into anybody's full-time job. Keep that in mind. So it is a stepwise progression forward. So pick the biggest items to send to them and expect them to do a manual uh, on it because uh, that's all they're going to do. They're, they're going to do a few and let's hope it's the most important ones. And this does bring up that, oh, it's a sliding scale. Data quality is a sliding scale. What are we going to do about that? You know, we're supposed to be able to report on data quality, but you know, we had we had we've had ten stand. I have I have a client that is is in constant motion with data quality, and I like that. They've had about I don't know uh, I'd say probably twelve to fifteen different levels of standard around data quality in the past year, and so that and that can get confusing because you can set a new standard and tell people, oh, we're at the we're at the standard but then you're, you're trying to get to the next level. Okay, I'm gonna leave that to you to uh, communicate that through metadata and raise the awareness of the fact that data quality is ongoing. Put that quality data in a leverageable program, you are platform, you are, you are just, you just don't have the bandwidth to, if you, especially if you haven't addressed it in, a, in a, any great way, you just don't have the bandwidth to address data quality everywhere in the organization. So let's address it in the most leverageable places, the data warehouse, the things you see here. Notice I added the feature store. Yeah, the feature store, very important now for your AI initiatives. I'll leave it at that. Maybe I'll expand on that sometime next year, but um, yes. And one of these leverageable platforms, that's where you want to address data quality. And that's why you want these. Is it, is it truly a data warehouse, for example, if you have 10 of them, you're just, you just happen to be calling 10 different databases, your data warehouse, and you're a mid-sized company? Mm, no, no, you, you don't have anything that's super leverageable there. So 
you're going to be spending uh, data quality efforts on 10 different data warehouses. And you're probably going to bring them to different levels. And it's going to be more confusing. So, you know, data architecture is a big part of data quality. I have definitely uh, been able to use the data quality lever to improve data uh, uh, architecture as well. So the data quality expectations, yeah, these are these are not the violations. These are the expectations, ultimately fit for purpose. Keep in mind, we're talking about raising the standard to the highest ever use case for that structure, not the one that's right in front of you. You want, you, you build these warehouses, these lakes for high, high leverage. That means you have to have a certain level of data quality in there. Every project, every project needs a focus on data quality. Um, and even, even AI uh, image making clearly needs a focus on data quality in terms of spelling. I don't know why they, they don't seem to spell very well. But anyway, I say, I say it's 10% of the budget, 10% of the budget for a project, give or take, depending upon circumstances. But that's about right for dealing with data quality. And if you haven't been doing that, you've been either ignoring it or doing a half job on it, hopefully good enough. Mm. Um, but yeah, keep keep that in mind, 10%. And I didn't mean to jump yet. Um, it's for a good cause. So if if you have to, you know, pull out the dark side and and find a way to get the get the money in and and use it for data quality, otherwise, well, it's for a good cause. And, and please notice some of these bullets here, information-based, in-store and contact center cross and upselling. As an example, what does that project need in terms of clean data? Clean meaning it, it's above standard for data quality. Needs clean customer and product data. Credit card fraud detection needs clean customer and transaction data, et cetera, et cetera. Why don't you do this for your upcoming projects? What kind of clean data do those projects need? And I've gone very, very lean for the slide. Um, and, and actually, what I just said is kind of the basis of our data quality program. So we find out what the heavy hitters are going to be by doing this cross matrix. And this is just a, a, a tip from me to you. It, it's a goal of mine for any project that I do, and I offer it to you here. If you can improve one of these very important measures of the business, such as reducing fake claims, reducing fraud, reducing returns, improving customer retention, you know, all the big things that your CEO talks about. Improve them by one point. It pays for the project. And uh, so, so, you know, don't be, don't, don't, go, don't kind of go, um, don't go too lean on your project because uh, you are actually doing something great for the business by improving data quality, improving the FXC of projects that are targeting these measures. And, and if you're working on a project now, I would say make sure it's targeting something like this and is trying to improve it by one point. And by the way, one point, it's, it's if, if like, for example, fraud is at 4%, you wanna drop it to 3%. That's what I mean by point, not percentage, not 3.96% because you dropped it by you know 1%, no, no, a full point full point and can be done, can be done. Data quality is a huge part of this. Your job is to make sure they know. Now let's look at streaming data. AI is a uh, huge uh, in terms of the use of uh, streaming data, streaming data, big data, what have you. These are put in big data collection systems. It, it One aspect of big data collection systems, and this is almost an aside to the whole quality issue, but it's important. There is exactly once versus at least once. Okay, yeah. Um, the idea here is that you, if you're bringing in streaming data, you want to be sure you're dealing well. You want to know what uh, kind of system you're dealing with. Is it one that will bring it, bring in every piece of data one time, in order? Do you even care? But you must know and technologies uh, of various types out there handle this differently. There's at least once with guaranteed order of delivery. Okay, that's the gold standard. At least once, but it does not guarantee the order of delivery. Do you care just so you get it all? Hmm, I don't know, depends on the data. A lot of times we don't, we just wanna be sure we get it all. Okay, 
Uh, and then there's exactly once uh, with the guaranteed order. Actually, I'm sorry, that's the gold standard, exactly once. Not at least once, because that implies it could, could grab a record twice. Okay, sorry about that. Exactly once with guaranteed order is your gold standard. So there's some technologies that do that. This is a moving target. Uh, keep an eye on that aspect of data quality for streaming data. Now, streaming data presents unique data quality challenges. Now, I'm not necessarily exclusively talking here about the uh, Gen AI, all right? Uh, these, this is all AI, and we're doing all AI, right? So data quality challenges in streaming data, high velocity, high volume, uh, high variety. Yet we need real-time data quality, data validation, data cleansing, and data monitoring. So streaming data presents these unique challenges. And you might say, well, we've had those challenges with our non-big data over the years, right? Okay, maybe you have. But it's like those challenges are on steroids when it comes to streaming data. High velocity. Of, I mean, I mean, some people don't like big data and it's kind of gone a little bit out of fashion. Uh, I don't like that because I like big data. I like the I like big data because uh, it's definitely di very different in its characteristics than the non non big data. Okay, that we used to deal with. I don't want to say small necessarily, but you know the non big data, the the pre big data, if you will. Uh, I see differences in the data from a quick glance at the velocity, the volume, the variety. You can tell if data is different. Now we're talking about streaming data, meaning meaning data. That might, it's probably sensors, probably sensor. Sensors throwing off data it might be click stream. It might be your full call log. If you're if you're on if you're doing telecom, it might be uh, you know very fine readouts of uh, different items in a healthcare setting, in a supply chain setting, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we almost all have it, um, but we do not almost all uh, are taking care of that big data yet. So you know we will get there. It's I would say that. It's a matter of time before you're going to need all data under management. Under management, yeah. These are some examples of data quality challenges with streaming data. You can get, for example, inaccurate predictive models. Uh, inaccurate data leads to incorrect predictions and waste resources on unnecessary retention efforts. They're trying to, to save me as a customer, yet I'm not going anywhere. Uh, a good example of this, I think, is I'm I'm I have a premier on American Airlines. I live in Dallas, um, but I haven't been flying as much lately, and I don't have a lot of choice <laughs> in the matter anyway. So they they're catching on to this, and I don't get upgrades and stuff like this anymore as much. And I think it's because of the analytics here. So good on them, I guess. I I would rather have my upgrade, but hey, that's the way it is. Inefficient resource allocation, incomplete and inconsistent data causing inefficient resource allocation and worsening traffic congestion, missed business opportunities, et cetera. So there are many challenges with streaming data uh, that are particular to it. Now, streaming data generates a large amount of data in real time. We know that. Uh, there's different aspects of data quality. Now, data quality is broadening to include many other things, such as lineage, which may be the most important factor in streaming data. So we need to be continuously monitoring streaming data. We, we must implement in real time because we cannot get behind when it comes to streaming data. This whole business that I talked about of moving things to a, a holding pen, if you will, yeah, it's still true. Yeah, you, you can still do that. And yes, you should. Uh, but highly selectively, because anything, anytime you're you're holding up the stream, uh, you're not going to hold up the stream, first of all, but anytime you're holding up the ability of data from the stream to get into your leverageable platform, uh, you are running the risk of, of it backing way up. And so supplement that streaming data with additional information from external sources to enhance its completeness and context. You really want to try to make this as automated as possible. Track the origin, transformation, and usage of streaming data. So to guarantee high-quality streaming data, 
A robust data quality framework is crucial involving real-time monitoring to identify anomalies and potential issues, real-time data validation rules and cleansing techniques used to correct errors. External information can enhance data completeness and context. Tracking the origin transformations and usage of streaming data ensures transparency, traceability, and auditability. It almost begs for some, some something new, something new to step into the fray and help us with these specific data quality issues as it comes as it pertains to streaming data. And to me, that is the the uh, a category of data observability. All right, data observability. Here's a look at a data observability tool. And you can see there are different, what they call drifts. And it's looking at data, all these things, correctness, completeness, uniqueness, number value, and then whatever, these are out of the box. And then it's whatever else that you've added to it. It's very important that you do not, again, even with data observability, accept what comes out of the box. So the traditional approach to data quality is no longer sufficient for fast streaming data. Data observability is a new approach designed specifically for streaming data. And it involves monitoring and analyzing data in real time to detect anomalies, errors, and data quality issues. Now, I could go on and on about uh, data observability. I'm coming out with a report on it uh, pretty soon. By the way, uh, there are rules out of the box, but they're also customizable. It looks at data drifts and anomalies when the data is not what we'll call normal, if you will. You need to understand this. It needs to understand seasonality to the data and, it's, and, 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 and the fact that it's okay on Black Friday for it to be a little bit bigger. Doesn't have to flag that. Doesn't have to flag Christmas season buying if you're in that business, et cetera. User can create their own rules. They're expectationless, if you will. Um, and then also what they expect sort of the sum to be over time. Like what, what's kind of a range that we expect sales to be in uh, for yesterday? And if it's not, let's flag that, et cetera. There needs to be a trend analysis where there's different colors, let's say, to some of the, uh, some of the options. I mean, the key to data observability is that it's gonna find a lot of things, but what's it gonna flag? And what's it gonna bring to you? And this is where it really shines because you can control that. Whereas in a manual data quality program, such as the ones that I've been doing for years and years, um, that is very hard. That part's very hard. What do we do with our data quality violations? So data observability solution functions like fitness trackers to these metrics for data, continuously assessing the state of the data as it flows through different systems. It is essential for data ops, the discipline of ex expediting data delivery, and is crucial for avoiding business disruptions. These tools can help identify and address data anomalies before they impact the business. Now, there's some uh, there's some confusion out there in terms of data observability. Uh, the subject of this presentation is Group One, uh, tools like Data Ban. Uh, from IBM, not tools like, and you'll hear these tools, Datadog, Dynatrace, Elastic, Grafana, New Relic. To me, those are not, those are a different kind of data observability. They don't do what we've talked about here today. They handle metrics, events, logs, and traces. Uh, good tools, don't get me wrong, just not dealing with data quality per se. The Gordian knot here, what I was building to is that there's so much data that it generates. Sifting through the data can be overwhelming. The Gordian knot is the difficulty of filtering out irrelevant data noise and identifying the critical signals that require attention. And you can change this level over time, which is the biggest thing to me, is that I can, I can meter out all the violations that it's going to find in the right proportion to the business that they can handle, yet they are still improving data quality over time. And by the way, I've been throwing around Gordian knot here for, for a while, and I never knew what it was. I looked it up. It was kind of, it's kind of an interesting story there. They said whoever could untie the knot would become the ruler of all of Asia. And nobody could untie the, the difficult knot there until Alexander the Great came along. Well, this is the story anyway. 
And he uh, whipped out his sword and cut through it and, and said, look, I've done it. And uh, yeah, he solved the puzzle of the Gordian knot. I think he cheated. I think, I think that's cheating. Okay, so what are you going to look for? What should you look for in data observability? Data lineage and pipelines. In this category, there is lineage visualization, which I mentioned might be one of the most important things to uh, big data. It's essential for data observability, providing a detailed map of the origin, transformation, and journey. There's also impact analysis, which is another critical component, preventing data misrepresentation, maintaining data lineage clarity, improving root cause analysis, and assessing change management. And then there's pipeline monitoring, also crucial ensuring data freshness, detecting errors, optimizing operational efficiency, and ensuring transparency. It helps identify delays, bottlenecks, and errors, and so on. Other things you want to look for, alerting and notifications. Yes, this is, this is where the, it monitors the data's life cycle and provides those real-time insights. Implementing these systems improves data quality, enhances operational efficiency, reduces downtime, and increases confidence in data-driven decisions. Data monitoring dashboards, uh, which is where somebody will stare for a while uh, every day and see uh, colors and take action. Data observability tools also provide rule completeness. So you wanna be sure that it covers the rules that are specific to you that might be kind of unique to your business and, or that you have the ability to actually do them yourself. And you want the data observability tool to do all this in real time have automated metadata collection, good source and API completeness, and for it to do all this with machine learning capabilities because if well implemented, they're going to be so much better than uh, non-machine learning approaches to big data, data quality. So in summary, data quality can and should have a value proposition. So don't just throw it around as if we all care about it, turn it into a value proposition. It's not gonna happen by accident. Consider data quality for all applications. Establish that value proposition. It's becoming part of data observability. So think of it as data quality, the historical data quality is uh, a part of the new data quality, which is data observability, which covers other things that are necessary in the land of big data. The traditional approach to data quality is no longer sufficient for fast streaming data. Observability is a new approach that is designed specifically for streaming data and involves monitoring and analyzing by adopting data observability for data quality organizations can improve data quality, reduce downtime, increase efficiency, and all good things. So thank you for joining. I'm gonna turn it back to Mark now to see if you have any questions for Daryl and I. Well, the chat has been absolutely electric, uh, which has been uh, fun to watch. Uh, we do have uh, one great question here. Um, uh, it's a little bit earlier on in the talk. So in your approach to data quality, what is the place for process improvements? So the business and IT processes that create, collect, and store, and deliver data stop producing defects? Yeah, um, I kind of... Uh, uh, I kind of... Uh... I kind of pooed on that, right? I said, I said, well, we can't do it. <laughs> we can't do it. You know, let let them let them let them deal with it. Now, that doesn't mean I won't I won't take an effort at uh, at at process improvement, at uh, data quality improvement as it comes over to to me in, in my whatever stage of the data life cycle, which is downstream from from earlier processes usually. Um, however, I, I'm realistic that. It's, it seldom happens on my timetable. I've, I've been chartered with building, let's say, a data warehouse. Um, the, the source systems uh, people and, and their projects, they're not, they're not so incented. They're not incented for this. So I just have to kind of deal with it. Uh, it's just kind of a fact of life that process improvement may or may not happen uh, for us, yet we still need to deal with data quality. So, And Daryl may have some thoughts to add on that, too. No, you're, you're spot on there, right? Um, you know, we find that um, people usually jump into data quality when they run into some issue, all right, or, or try to improve processes. But no, you're spot on with your answer there. I love it. 
Excellent. Well, uh, we have a few more questions coming into Q and A here. Uh, what are some strategies for communicating the value of data quality to executive stakeholders? That's a popular data quality question. <laughs> it is. It is. And uh, um, yeah, so I turn it. I turn it into um, return on investment. So yes, we can. We can. We have the project budget. It's going to be X, or it can be X plus ten percent. And with that X plus 10%, we're going to improve the efficacy of this project by, well, first of all, we're going to improve the data quality of the project from, well, we just profiled the data and we saw that it was at 93. We're going to improve the data to a 96, and that translates into thus and such improved efficacy of the project. Now, hopefully the project is driving ROI. That's where the ROI comes from. It doesn't come from data quality. It comes from... Uh, let's say predictive maintenance or comes from targeted marketing or fraud detection or something like this. We're going to make it better. You're going to get more fraud detected if you improve the data uh, quality. Um, and, and how much more fraud? I don't know. How much more do you need to pay for a measly uh, data quality program? Like I said, a little goes a long way. And if you can, if you're if you're trying to improve that fraud by one percent, give me what give me what it takes. Give me what it takes, or one point. Give me what it takes, and 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 part of that is data quality. So let's let's be sure we're attending to data quality uh, with that ten percent. Right. And and will I add my two cents? This is a conversation that I have a lot, and it, and I always turn it into a uh, dollars game, like you mentioned, a return on investment. Um, and I know you mentioned this earlier in your um, <clears throat> presentation here, but uh, just a simple example. The worse data you feed your models, the, the worse those models are going to be, right? So yeah. as it relates to your project or your product or your end game, the better quality data you have, the more refined your uh, end product's going to be. So I turn that conversation into a return on investment and say, if we improve X here, these are the results we're going to see, right? And execs are really dollar driven, right? I promise you. Yes, absolutely. This to hammer that home even further because I've done this in the in in real life uh, where I've said uh, we've had a, a mail out campaign for alumni donations at high in higher ed and uh, and I was able to show that hey 36 percent of our mail is getting returned um, for the mail that doesn't get returned we're getting 10 percent of those come back with donations so if we fixed a good chunk of our mail that is not accurate and got better mailing addresses, we could see this much more donation revenue. Uh, so sometimes it, it it can be very easy to calculate what that is. And then people will be like, oh, if you're going to save us or bring in $200,000 worth of revenue, we'll happily give you $100,000 to work on data quality. That, that's a great example. And let me just add real quick that you're, you're probably doing other great things for the business by improving the data quality as well. But uh, don't, don't, don't I, I would, my advisement would be don't go out there and tr try to list 10 things and, and mm. show ROI for 10 things uh, for to get data quality budget. Just just find the one or two that are going to they're going to make it happen, like the one that you mentioned, Mark. Yeah, that's uh, wonderful. I think we have time for one quick question. Can you explain the relationship of data observability and statistical process control? That's a tough one. <laughs> um, I can't because I'm not <laughs> sure what uh, the questioner means by that. Uh, not a term that that I deal with, maybe Daryl does, I don't know. I'm speaking on mute. That was not a term I'm familiar with as well. So I don't under, I guess I don't get the question. I think I, I, I think it's uh, statistical process control comes from uh, a lean environment, if I remember correctly. Um, but uh, but I'm, I'm kind of stretched there as well. Um, William, we were talking uh, earlier in the week about just the overall um, need for data observability uh, because cloud solutions and software as a service is so chatty. Maybe we can uh, briefly talk about that. Chatty, chatty. Uh, um, 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 you mean uh, network network lag? We can't actually uh, do data quality because of network lag. <laughs> There's all sorts of opportunities there, right? That that mm -hmm. we we haven't really had the ability to uh, 
to to deal with because it, it's it's coming so fast and uh, the data quality may may be suspect may may quite well be suspect on some of those systems. I mentioned in my in my deck I talked about you know uh, getting data exactly once, getting data uh, in order. Um, <clears throat> those are problems with with systems like that. And there are other problems. And uh, unless you have data observability, you just can't deal with those problems. And I think there's ROI there in, in network improvement. And, and of course there's cost to uh, data observability and the, and the whole program. But uh, whenever you see that there is uh, an opportunity to, uh, to drive some ROI, uh, I think it behooves us to take a look. And that is definitely uh, an area that, that has, has draw, uh, driven up the data observability uh, market, even though it's, you know, it's emerging at this point, mm -hmm. but that's going to be a driver for sure. Barely, you get the last word. No, no. So, uh, you know, William is so insightful. Um, so we've actually uh, got a product data band that was mentioned, uh, coupled with this other product called uh, Manta Lineage, right? And then coupled with this other uh, application called Data Stream Set. We're seeing that trend of data observability being so key you try to understand if I tweak this, what would my downstream look? How would that make my data quality go down? Or even from an investigative pers uh, perspective, saying, hey, I see my data quality my data quality go down. What changed to affect that, right? Mm -hmm. So my, my point to you is we're seeing businesses come to us and asking us for solutions for that. And yep. you know we're actually in the game of that. So it, it is real and... Um, let me know if you have any questions about it. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. That's all we have time for today. And thank you for this wonderful presentation from both William and Daryl. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Thank you all.